This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Want to know what's going on in your neck of the woods and learn the history and the people behind the events that you love across the state? Get to know the real Mississippi. Check out MPB Think Radio's Next Stop Mississippi podcast on all platforms or on the MPB public media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Now You're Talking. It's the show about the most interesting people and stories of Mississippi. And I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey. I'm editor-at-large and editorial cartoonist of Mississippi Today. Licensed clinical social worker, coach, author, therapist, podcaster, and goal-setting guru. Goal-setting guru. Now, that's what I need in my life right there, definitely. We got Jocelyn Lane. She's going to be here today to discuss her newest book, The Power of Self-Love. It's a self-help guide on how to break free from unhealthy relationships. The book guides readers through the process of recognizing warning signs in relationships, establishing healthy boundaries, and embracing self-love. And we're going to dive into the current mental health crisis sweeping the nation and right here in Mississippi, plus her career, future projects, and much, much more. Hey, by the way, thank you for listening listening today. I hope you're having a good Monday so far. And I don't know about the rest of the state of Mississippi, but I know in central Mississippi, this strange, weird substance fell out of the sky and it hit windshields. And apparently this, whatever the substance is, it caused people to forget how to drive. And they like went all over the roads and everything else. It was crazy. I Now somebody told me it was called rain. Isn't that H2O? H2O. Oh, that sounds, that's like, isn't that a chemical <laughs> weapon or something? I don't know. No, it, it literally rained and it thundered right about the time I was in the shower. Lightning hit right near the house. That was exciting. I've just got so much titanium in me, of course. You know, I'm a, I'm a human lightning rod. Yeah. So, man, Jermaine, good weekend. It was good. It was good. I'm here. That's the best. You are vertical. You are vertical. That's the best thing. <laughs> that's what I know. Tell somebody. Yeah, I'm vertical. You know, right. Which actually, I'd kind of like to be horizontal because that means I'd be asleep. That, that, that would be there, a good thing. That point there. <laughs> yeah, so the weekend for us was um, Mama needed some boy therapy, as in go see her boys. So my oldest son lives in Huntsville, Alabama. Mm-hmm. So we drove up there, which was quite lovely, and it was a nice weekend. That city is just exploding. It's amazing how it goes up there. Right. So we went to go see him, and we took him shopping, and he took us to all of his favorite restaurants, and it was a great time. I slept on an air mattress. Which that's which, comfortable. Oh, just amazing! And his apartment on the floor. <laughs> um, so basically, I'm now an inch shorter <laughs> from yeah. that. You know the things that Dad does. That's so nice. Uh, and we brought Pip, uh, the the amazing oh, border terrier, with us because uh, she has diabetes. So she, so precious. she, oh yeah, she was great. So she barked at every single human being she saw that's over right. the whole weekend. That's right. And then we went to where my other son goes to college, and we visited him and had a nice picnic lunch because okay. we can't take Pip into a restaurant. And uh, Pip could get in. She could. They'll Actually, let Pip in. Pip is more famous, I found out, than I am. All you have to do is pull up Pip's Facebook page, I mean, Instagram page, and uh, they'll let Pip in. Oh, she is. She's, she's got fans. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. She's like the old feist dog that Farmer Jim used to have back all those years ago on radio. You know, she's very popular. But now, like I said, you know, you, we're talking about mental health today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things of my wife and her parents, she's at that stage in life where her parents are not doing well and everything. And so... Yeah. It's just so important for her to be able to see her boys. Yeah. And so it was great. But, you know, it was fun. I yeah. enjoyed it. And I'll be on the road this week. I will be up in Oxford and in Tupelo. So. Well, you're going to need some therapy. Yes, I'm going to need some. No, I'm like the tin man. I'm going to need a can of oil. <laughs> Somebody's going to have to squirt that on that because I'm walking like that right now. Get you some self-love today. <laughs> uh, some self-love, definitely. Or the power of self-love as well. i tell you what, I'm excited to have Jocelyn Lane on with us today. Um like I said earlier in the introduction, just a long list of accomplishments. The new book out is The Power of Self-Love. It's how to break free from unhealthy connections. Jocelyn, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to get to meet you officially via radio. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. How are things on the coast? Things are things are good. It's uh, partly cloudy with a little bit of beach added, so things are good. Partly cloudy with a little bit of beach added. That would be a good T-shirt. <laughs> That'd be great. Yes, I'll have to. I'll have to coin that one. I have to coin it. So um, now I know you. You know you got your degrees. You were Jackson State and so forth. Are you from the coast originally, or did you just kind of migrate your way down that way? I am not from the coast originally. I am originally from a small town in Jasper County, um, Bay Springs, Mississippi. That's where I was born and raised, and I attended college in Jackson and met a man and got married, and that's how I ended up in on the coast. How awesome is that? that that's a pretty cool story. So, But obviously, you've, you've developed a good practice down there, and 
You know, obviously, if anybody's been paying any attention whatsoever, particularly since the pandemic, I, I would say, and this is the cartoonist view who slept in a Holiday Inn last night. I actually slept on an air mattress. But um, we have, I, I would say we have a mental health issue crisis in this country. Uh, you know, I think people, everybody seems to be angry. If you get on Facebook, you can kind of tell people, or, you know, it seems like everybody's unpacking something right now. And, I'm, and you're, you're right there on the front lines. I mean, you're, you've got clients, you're dealing with this day in, day out. Is that kind of your sense too? Do you feel like that just people can't quite put their finger on it, but they're just full of some kind of angst? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, since COVID, um, there has definitely been an upswing in anxiety and depression because, of course, we were all isolated from each other. That's right. And we're not meant to be alone. <laughs> you know, that's not good for our psyche, and that's not good for our emotional health either. So while we may have people that are introverts and, you know, they kind of say, well, I like being alone, but you have the option to go out whenever you're ready and, you know, engage with other people. And so during COVID, we did not have the opportunity to kind of make that decision for ourselves or whether we were going to go out or we were going to stay home. So for a lot of people, it was very depressing. And, you know, on top of that, feeling like if I go outside, I may contract this illness that I can't see. And what happens to me if I contract this illness? And, you know, what will I be bringing home to my family or what may I, you know, what will I be giving to my adult parents and other elderly people. So it was a lot of depression and anxiety mixed. And so what we know is that that stuff doesn't just go away. That's right. Right. So we're still dealing with the effects of COVID even now, even though we've been out of out of the crisis for a while. COVID is still around. And so we're still dealing with that, you know, as time goes on. And if people are not getting the help that they need and trying to deal with that on their own, that can sometimes really cause some some mental and emotional anguish. And you just touched on something right there, not getting the help that they need. And and I can tell you this from personal experience, uh, there is a stigma around mental health. And and I know that, and, and I'm going to tell folks all across Radio Land that I went to go see a therapist when my parents were very, very sick and they were dying. It, it stirred up a lot of just kind of like a boat prop through the mud. It was just a really tough time for me and and for my family and, and, and so forth. So I went to go see a therapist and I remember that first time I went, I wanted to hide behind a potted plant so that nobody could see me there. Like I thought for some reason I was weak or whatever. Well, I wasn't weak. I was very strong for actually going and seeking help. But what are right. some what are some things and some thoughts on that? Because like I said, we've got to get past the fact where people don't feel like that they can go get help because it's it's hard enough to find help. But if you feel like in your head that somehow that people are going to judge you, that's a, that's a really tough barrier to get across. It definitely is. And you're right. Um, a lot of times I know when I opened my practice, we were unintentionally down like a, a, a dead end street. And the amount of people that would come in and say, oh, I'm so glad that you're on this bed and street because no one would see me. And I don't have to worry about anybody seeing me. And so, you know, hearing people say that, you know, and and listening to them say that can sometimes be, you know, discouraging. But it made me want to educate people on the need to, you know, break the stigma of mental health. Right. Because we know that there are some huge societal stigma when it comes to mental health. When we think about somebody with mental health, the first thing people say is, oh, they're crazy, oh, they're hearing voices, or they're, you know, they go to the extreme. And so what we know is that mental health um, encompasses us all. We've all suffered in some way. We've all been depressed before. We've all been anxious about something. And depending on how our coping skills are set up, you know, then we have to decide whether we have to do a little bit more and go see someone. And I I tell people all the time it would be the same way if you had the flu. If you had the flu and it didn't get better in a couple of days, a couple of weeks, you wouldn't stay there and get worse. Exactly. You would go to your doctor and you would park right at the front door because you want to get better. You want whatever medication they have to make you better, you want to do that. And so I think it's really important for us to break the stigma of people coming into a mental health clinic to receive treatment. Because we really don't know what that person is coming in for, just like we don't when it comes to the doctor. They could be coming in for anxiety, for depression. We don't know. But that stigma is there, and it's so strong that we just assume the worst when we hear people talking about going in to see somebody in mental health. 
Okay, I just want to let you know, I'm standing on the desk saluting right now, just to let you know. <laughs> I mean, you, you got me saying amen, my hands are in the air, because um, you're right. Because, I mean, we don't, like I said, if, if your heart's not working well, you don't feel shame for going to the cardiologist. If you have cancer, you go to the oncologist, you know, so um, it's just... It, it helps because the brain is such a tricky thing that sometimes it can lie to you. And if you don't get somebody that can, um, from the outside that's an expert that can help you, coach you, guide you, get you through this, then, man, it's tough. And I got to tell you, on a personal front, it, it, t- it changed my life, changed it totally for better. So uh, thank you for all you do. And I just want to let you know I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's dive in the book a little bit. Um, I love this. And I'm going to kind of go through the chapters and just kind of because I, I think the way you've set the book up and this is the book part is that you really have set up a really quick, easy book for somebody who's struggling in a relationship to go through it. It's not going to take a ton of your time, but it's going to kind of give you a pathway. It's going to illuminate a path for people to understand where they are right now, where they need to go, and how they need to get there. And, and so, right. yeah, and, and so, I mean, we're, we are here right now, right now. So chapter one is recognizing red flags and how to spot a toxic relationship. Um, toxic relationship, I guess that's the first place we need to start. How do you define that? Well, toxic can be defined in many ways. And a lot of times I will tell you that right now we're in the world that toxic the word toxic and the word narcissist are buzzwords. Everybody's using them. They don't really know what they mean, but they sound really good. And when you say it, it kind of gives you, you know, people are like, okay, well, she must know what she's talking about. She's saying toxic. So what that is is relationships that are not dis- that are not functional. That's all it is. Okay. It's relationships that are not functioning for your good. That's right. You're in the thick of those relationships, and they're not functioning for your good. So that can be family relationships, that can be romantic relationships, that can be friendships, and that can also be work relationships. All of those can be toxic. All of those can be unhealthy. Well, how do you spot them? I mean, because, I mean, everything from, I know, you know, you talk about it's a lack and respect of boundaries, and we hear boundaries thrown around a lot, uh, but what how do you recognize your boundaries are not being respected and even know what a boundary is? Well, some of the things that I mentioned in the book um, in spotting that is going to be, you know, the lack of respect for boundaries. You know, that's a huge one. Um, a lot of times, you know, I talk to parents and they're saying, you know, well, I told my child like, that they couldn't do that. And then they're still doing it. And I'm like, okay, what was the consequence? And then they're quiet and there's no consequence. And I'm like, okay, well, there's no boundary. And where there's no boundary, what we do know for sure is that people will cross because you're not, you know, you have to love yourself enough to say, okay, I'm stepping back from that. So that respect uh, for boundaries is definitely when it comes up. Um, blame shifting. When, when you know that someone has done something and then before the end of the conversation, you're the one apologizing. Yeah. That's, that's definitely one to look for in that blame shifting. Um, gaslighting and manipulation. Gaslighting is also another one of those buzzwords right now. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody says, you know, you're gaslighting me. Um, gaslighting, you know, in in just lay terms, people will make you feel like you're crazy. Like what you saw, you know, you didn't see it. What you heard, you didn't hear that. Oh, well, you heard it, but it wasn't quite what I said. Or you're imagining that it wasn't, you know, no, it, well, you just, you're always doing that. And it kind of makes you feel like, well, am I always doing that? Am I? And it makes you look at yourself in a critical way instead of looking, you know, looking inward and saying, no, I heard exactly what that was. And so, you know, responding to that in a way that you're confident. But instead, it makes you look at things in a way that, you know, makes you self critical. And sometimes that can be harmful to who you are as a person into, you know, the boundaries that you set up. Because if you're looking at yourself and you're critical of everything you're saying, how good are your boundaries going to be? That's right. Yeah, they're not going to be very well either. You know, and if you, if someone's isolating you, you know, from your friends and family, if they're saying, oh, well, I don't want you to go to your mom's house every Sunday for Sunday dinner, you should come and be with me. And, you know, they don't love you like I do. And, you know, you're going out with your friends and, and now it's not okay or that you, you're you afraid to do that because it's going to be an argument and you don't want to argue. And so there are things like that as well um, that I kind of talk about in the book that are key red flags 
to knowing when you're in a relation, a toxic relationship or a relationship that, you know, is unhealthy, the imbalance of power, you know, is, is this relationship not equal? Can I not tell you how I feel about something? You can only tell me how you feel. That's right. And I have to accept it. You know, so a lot of times we're in these relationships and you cannot see it because you're in the thick of it. So I thought it was really important to write about these red flags so that people can say, oh, yeah, this is happening to me. This this particular thing is happening. And so that they can kind of jot down and say, okay, well, this is happening, this is happening, so that they can have time to reevaluate. So instead of gaslighting, you need to be spotlighting. You know, you need to actually, be, <laughs> you, you need to be seeing things. So I tell you. You need to spotlight. Exactly. Exactly. Spotlight. That's, that's right. It's a spotlight. You're listening to Now You're Talking on MPB Think Radio. I am your host, Marshall Ramsey, and I'm back with author and therapist Jocelyn Lane. We're talking a little bit about her new book. We're talking a lot about her new book, The Power of Self-Love, and it's how to break free from unhealthy connections. So to kind of review, basically, you have to be able to spotlight that you've got issues going on in your relationship, and you really did touch on some great ways. The book does a good job kind of taking the reader through, um, oh, yeah, you have a problem, and here's some things you can do to recognize the problem and then do action steps to be able to get out of it. You know, I took a finance class back in college, and I learned about the opportunity cost, and that's basically the financial cost of making certain decisions. And, you know, if you make a decision to stay in a bad relationship, you are definitely paying some huge opportunity costs there in, in your future, in your life. And it also can cause a lot of costs to your life, like self-esteem issues, depression, anxiety, stress, financial stress. So that's why this is so important for people to understand that well, maybe I need to do something about this relationship. Yes, absolutely. Um, not only do you have those psychological effects there's a lot around the physical effects of staying in a relationship that is not working for you um headaches heart issues blood pressure issues i mean there are so many correlations of stress from relationships that correlate directly to your physical health so not only do you have to worry about your psychological health you also have to worry about your physical health as well you know, um, your finances, you mentioned that you had taken that course, you know, your finances are, may also take a hit, you know, your career, if you can't focus at work, you know, that could impact how you are able to get ahead in your career or your job. Um, your relationships with your friends and family can be strained. That's right. And we, you know, and if we know that if our relationships are strained, that means that we don't have a whole lot of support around us. And so what we know is when we don't have support, then we tend to stay in bad relationships because we don't have the support, you know, or someone there saying, hey, you know, I agree with you. This is probably not the healthiest place for you to be. You know, you need to revisit this. So it can take a toll in many ways on us. Hey, you talked about low self-esteem at causing that, but I think a lot of it sounds like that. You know, when you're in a bad relationship, you're probably dealing with bad self-esteem anyway because the boundaries issues and so forth like that. And and I think that's where the power of self-love really comes in, isn't it? Is being right. able to, to to have enough confidence and enough faith in yourself to say, you know what, I, I matter and, and I need to be, right. you know, I need to get out of this situation because this isn't good for me. Right. And doing a lot of self-reflection. Yeah. That's key as well. You know, a lot of times we don't take them a moment to step back and look at ourselves and say, hey, have I contributed to being in this space? And if I have, how can I love myself enough to move forward? So self-reflection is key. Um, taking a hard look at where you are, understanding that you don't have to stay there, that there's an opportunity for you to move, it's an opportunity for you to grow. Because what's the alternative if you stay in that situation? You know, um, what happens to you? That's right. You know, I would, I would much rather leave and take my chances on having a happy life to, than to stay in something that I know is going to be detrimental to my mental health and my physical health. Oh, that's that's so hard, though. I mean, that, that sometimes it's hard because, you know, you're thinking, oh, I have this reason or this reason or this reason. And, and, and I love what you wrote 
uh, there was a line you wrote that just really jumped out at me. It said, if you don't love yourself, it's hard to believe anyone else can l- love you. Which, mm-hmm. wow. That, I mean, that, that's strong as onions. Right, right. How can I believe that anyone else would love me if I'm not loving myself? Right. And, right. and with that, you know, there's that energy that you're putting off if you're not loving yourself. And people can pick up on that energy, believe it or not. They can pick up on the energy that you don't have good self-esteem. They can pick up on the energy that you don't do any self-reflection, that you have no boundaries. And if you get entangled with a person who can take advantage of you at that point, you know, that can lead to a really hurtful relationship. And it can take years for you to come out of that. So we really have to remember that, you know, it's okay to take small steps to um, leave the relationship. And and times people will say, well, I don't want to get involved in somebody else's relationship. I don't want to tell them to go or stay, and I don't want to. But sometimes the best gift you can give a person is to say, you know what, you're not crazy. What you're experiencing is absolutely not right, and you should go ahead and leave. Yeah, if you get a hold of somebody like a narcissist or something, man, mm-hmm. that's a, it's it's over. Because I mean, they yeah. will they will feed off of you like a shark on chum. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you talk about this, you, you talk about self love and everything, and I think you have a very important point that you know it's it's like building a puzzle. It's not something that happens just instantly. It's something that you have to take steps and you do the work, and then you know that that healing is not a. You know, it's not an instant uh, because I think we like we're a microwave society, right? We we like everything to happen instantly um, because we can do everything instantly now. But this is just a process that takes time. Right, right. It is a process that takes time. And we have to remind ourselves to be gentle with ourselves during the process. Right. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to, you know, happen maybe even in a year. You still may be trying to figure out what your next move is going to be. But the important thing is that you don't stop moving. Exactly. The important thing is that you don't give up and that you put the tools, you know, put the things in place so that you can move forward. Because you Justin, know, that's be hard. Honest, that's hard, though, because you know, there's times when you want to get in the fetal position and eat ice cream right. and, and watch, you know, Netflix. Absolutely. My dad used to say, you have 24 hours to cry, and then after 24 hours, I need a plan. I like your dad. <laughs> I'll give you the 24 hours to, to cry, to to moan and, and feel sorry for yourself, but after the 24 hours, what's, what's, what's your plan? You know, but if you don't have somebody that's there that's helping you and that also recognizes that your emotional well-being is not good, then it can be difficult for you to move forward. And so that's what I mean by being gentle with yourself and recognize some people really have to have a plan in order to leave a relationship. They can't just pick up and, and go. They have kids. They have jobs it may be some financial things going on they may not be in in a place that they can financially pick up and leave so this may be a plan you know a longer term plan for them so sometimes you have to be a little gentle with yourself but also stay on track so that you can get to where you need to get to get out of that relationship all right i'm gonna be nosy for a half second have you ever had a moment in your life when you had to have a 24-hour cry and then come up with a plan to be able to make a major life change Absolutely. <laughs> I've had several. <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Okay. I have had, I have had that. Um, I was married for 19 years and decided to end um, a 19-year marriage. Oh, Justin, that's hard. Yeah. That, that's... Yeah, with a daughter that's a senior in high school. Yeah. So trying to maneuver all of those pieces and, you know, all of that and trying to get her ready for college was a huge transition but i knew that i needed to make the transition had i not made the transition where would i be so this isn't yeah this isn't just you writing a book this is stuff that you've lived and you've been there stuff that i've lived yes this yeah. is stuff that i've lived and that i've been there and so that's why i thought it was really important even as a therapist to be able to um you know to be able to have the conversation because people sometimes look at therapists as like superheroes. Right. You know? And that, oh, if you're a therapist, then everything in your life should be perfect. And that's not the case. We're still human beings. You know, that's, a, like, that's like saying a doctor should never get sick. You know, because <laughs> you should have all the answers. So myself, I had to get into therapy to recognize some of the patterns that I was living 
And then I had to recognize and come up with a plan in order to exit that relationship. And it was a very hard decision to make, but it was a necessary decision to make. That happens a lot. I, you know, I'm in 30 years, man. You know, my youngest is 16, and I'm not leaving my wife, uh, Amy, just to let you know <laughs> everything's okay. But I, but don't we see, leave your wife. Don't leave your no, wife. No, but I mean, we see some of my my kids, my older kids, particularly their parents. You know, it seems like when the kids leave the house, then they call it, I guess, a silver divorce or something like that. But basically, and and that seems to be, you see a lot of it about that on the news. And so it's a tough thing. But I mean, you know, marriages are in relationships, they have seasons and they have cycles and you you have to really work to keep them going and keep them fresh, don't you? Yes, you do. You do. And um, the the good thing about that, because I did, you know, the therapist had a therapist. So (laughs) the good thing about that was that I was able to recognize my part and a lot of times people don't, don't you know, own up to, to their part of the situation. I had to recognize my part. And so in recognizing my part, I was able to put my anger in a different space so that I could be a good co-parent moving forward. That was more important to me than being angry. And when I sat down with my therapist and she said, okay, so you've made your decision. Okay, so what are we doing here? You know, what are we doing? And so I was in a position where I was now – having to give the same, you know, having to take the same advice that I give to my clients. That makes you a better therapist, though. Yeah. (laughs) Put myself in a vulnerable space, you know, to say, I don't have it all together. You know, I am in a relationship that I need to get out of. Um, And how do I do that? You know, how, what plans have I made? You know, so a lot of the things that I talk about in the book are real things that I did in my life to move forward. And because I was able to do those things with the help of, of my therapist, you know, and just living some of those things, you know, you got 24 hours to, to cry and you need to come up with a plan. And so because I was able to do those things, you know, now I'm able to, we're able to, to do things together as a family and all of that. So oh, that's fantastic. Out, yeah. Instance, to be, you know, a gift and a curse per se. You know, I, I, we're now able to, to laugh and talk and chuckle with each other and also spend time with our daughter and it not be a toxic, toxic situation. There's no arguing, there's no finger pointing because we did the work to get to a better place. That's right. You did the you work. Know, we, we weren't, yeah. Right. Right. We weren't able to do that work together, but we were able to do that work separately so that we could come together to be the best parents that we could be to our daughter. I got to tell you this, and and I I don't know about your experience, but one of the things that I learned, of course, the brain is literally the part of your body that uses up the most energy. And and to help save energy, it makes shortcuts, right? So we tell stories, we cut through things, we see things, we instantly put them into a different pot. We literally run on autopilot. (laughs) You know, we don't realize it. And and what I realized was that, man, I've, I've been a total jerk. You know, because it, and it wasn't that I was doing it on purpose. It was just that I was reacting to things that happened to me when I was young. And so right. suddenly I was placing things that happened to me in current day in those same pots that, you know, that happened to me as a kid because that's easy. Right. So I had to learn right. how to break that cycle to be able to be a better husband, a better father, a better employee right. and everything else. And that's why I mean, that's one of the things I did appreciate about your book was that. Um, I think any kind of relationship you have that it helps you just kind of wake up and, you know, use that spotlight analogy to be able to see what's really going on around you so that you can you can you can make that plan and do that work. And and you talk about setting boundaries and saying no. And and that's so hard, especially if you do have self-esteem issues, because you don't want to disappoint anybody. Right. So, yeah. So no is like, oh. No, you know, it's hard to get it out. It's the hardest two letter word in the world. It's also the most liberating two word in the in the word right, world too. Right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. So you talk about codependency and so forth, and we hear that a lot. That's another one of those fancy words. Um, but that's just a cycle and it? it's kind of a pattern. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I will tell you that a lot of people who are codependent that started in their childhood. Yeah. So if you're not dealing with childhood issues, then they follow you um, into your adulthood. 
you know, and being afraid, you know, what type of attachment do you have? Are you an anxious attachment where you have to really talk to that person all the time and you're calling them all the time and you're texting them all the time? You know, are you able to let them be who they are in the relationship? You know, so a lot of times that codependency follows us and it manifests in ways that are not healthy in these relationships. So we really have to be careful. And once we see ourselves doing that, or if we see our partner doing that, that we're able to, you know, pull back and say, hey, you know, let's look at this situation a little bit differently. Because that person may not even recognize what they're doing. Yeah, so really I, I, yeah I've always heard it kind of, you know, a lot of times when you don't know what you're doing, and it's, it's kind of like you're in a waterfall, and, and really your superpower is being able to pull yourself out of that waterfall and being able to look around and see what's actually going on in that moment. So, and that's exactly what it kind of sounds like. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, it, again, you know, we have to go back to that self-reflection. You know, it starts there. It, start, it really starts there when you can take a step back and look and say, hey, this is not the way that this is supposed to be going. And I need to do something different and be committed to being your healthiest mentally and emotionally moving forward. Yeah, your your dad and my dad sound like pretty much the same guy. I, and I, they're probably not, but they kind of <laughs> it kind of came from that same you know, um, you know. My dad was the same way, and, and I miss him deeply just for that reason. I just knew I could call him and get, but it kind of kind of dives into the next uh, chapter when you're talking about asking for a lifeline or seeking support. And you had that support. You know, you were able to call him and say, hey, I, I need help. But also, too, you know, like I said, get a therapist, seek somebody at church, have a friend. I mean, there's just – it's important to have a good – I always say you're the sum of your five closest friends kind of thing. You know, it's always good mm-hmm. to have people that you can depend on that will be honest mm-hmm. with you. Mm-hmm. And it's also – it's also important to have a, a a therapist, a mental health professional, counselor that doesn't know you personally. Yes. Because what we have to remember is your friends and your family, they love you. So they're going Oh yeah, speak for yourself. They're going to <laughs> you. They're going to be angry. They're yeah. going to all of the things. So as you're moving through your work and through your feelings, they're still stuck at what you told them. You know, so it's important to also have that support, but also get the, you know, the support from a person who doesn't know you personally, that has no, you know, they don't have anything in the game. You know, they are just a person that you're going to talk to, like you would just go into your primary care doctor and tell you exactly what it is. Because during those times are times when that person is going to say, well, did you consider that? maybe you did this or have you considered that maybe you could have handled this a different way. And a lot of times your friends and family won't tell you that, you know, so it's important to have that because this is the, this process is doing some internal work as well. And you have to do that internal work so that you don't end up in another relationship that's unhealthy. Yes. That boy right there. If I had a bell, I'd be ringing it right now. Um, Because that's the thing. If you don't do the work and fix it, then you're going to end up just repeating history over and over and over. You repeat what you don't repair. That's right. You know, and so if you're not repairing it, if you're just going over it and not having the the necessary conversations, then you are doomed to repeat that. You're listening now. You're talking on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey. It's Monday. Thank you for listening. Glad to have you here. We got good shows today. I hope you've been enjoying it. And I'm back with author of The Power of Self-Love, Jocelyn Lane, who is a therapist down on the beautiful Mississippi Gulf Coast, who is on with us today via via the uh, the whole telephone thing, which is kind of cool. Man, Jocelyn, this has been great. Thank you. And I think you've given us some good tips. Like I said, you, just to kind of review you got to kind of recognize the signs that things aren't working out real well. You need to, uh, obviously, because of, uh, you know, you need to make sure you have practice self-love and take good care of yourself. And I think we're at the point now where we're talking about rebuilding yourself in the healing process. And, and you've been through a breakup. You know what it's like. It's really tough. And, you know, the temptation is to do all the wrong things, to do instant gratification, to make yourself feel better in that moment when you're feeling miserable. But those are going to do long-term damages. So you've got to do some real important things to help yourself heal and to move on to the next destination. What are some of those things? So 
when you're in that in the situation like that, the very first thing is to, to give yourself a moment to step back and grieve. Yeah. Divorce, ending relationships, ending friendships, ending things like that, all of that is like a death. You're grieving a situation, you're grieving a person, you're grieving, you know, what, what your life that was that would no longer be. Um, that having to step out into something that is totally new and foreign to you is scary. So my first suggestion would be to give yourself step back, give yourself the time and the space to grieve. Um, and in that grief, you know, allow yourself to have the full range of emotions. Because we know, like, with the stages of grief, you're going to go through all of the stages of emotions. So when you're going through ending a relationship, you know, giving yourself some grace because you are going to grieve. Um, also making sure that you're taking care of yourself um, during that time. Self-care is going to be key. A lot of times when I talk to um, women and men who are in situations where they have left relationships or left jobs or their spouses, spouses passed away and they're in the transition moment, I always ask them, well, what do you like? What's your favorite food? And a lot of times they're stuck because they don't know. They haven't really thought about it. You know, a lot of times for moms, they like whatever their children like. So if I say, what's your favorite ice cream? They're looking at me and they're saying, well, I eat cookies and cream, but I really, really, really like vanilla. But I get cookies and cream because that's what my kids like. That's what they get. And I don't want to buy two ice creams. So sometimes you forget all of the things that you like. You forget who you are as a person. So going back, taking that step back, involving yourself in some real self-care. I'm not talking about just maintenance stuff, getting your nails done and your toes done and all of that. I mean real self-care where you are really taking care of your emotional and mental health and figuring out who you are as a person. Um, doing some yoga. I think yoga is great. It's a great start to um, some of that. Even just like revisiting some of the things that you liked before you were in a relationship. Did you like to cook? You know, maybe you can start back cooking, figuring out what those things are that you like so that you can engage those things that make you feel good, that make you feel like, you know, you are important. And so you need those things to, to fuel yourself during that time of grief. So that's what I would suggest. I like you. You talk about creating a new vision. Tell us a little bit about that, because like I said, it, you know, you sounds like, you know, like, wait a minute. You look backwards. You're like, hey, these are the things that I used to be and I really liked. But then you have to kind of sit down saying, wait a minute, where do I want the rest of my life to go? Right. So in doing that, that's, that's that, there go. There we are back, back at the planning. <laughs> there we are back at planning. When you're looking at creating a new vision for yourself, it can be scary. Because you don't know, you know, what I know is what I know and what I don't know is, is scary. And so a lot of times people will stay in situations that they know because stepping outside of that is terrifying. And so once you step outside of that, learning, you know, who you are and what you want for yourself moving forward. And a lot of times people don't think about, you know, they've been in these relationships and they haven't been able to be who they needed to be during the relationship. So they are confused and they're scared. And so stepping back, trying to figure out, giving yourself some good self-care so that you can figure out what the vision for your new life looks like. And so that you can walk authentically into that new vision, into that new life, so that you make sure that you don't um, continue with the same patterns of unhealthy relationships. You know, in Chapter 8, you, you talked about communicating effectively. And and I can tell you this, and like I said, I'm not giving away anything in my marriage that Amy wouldn't agree with. So I'm not, I, I'm not that stupid, right? So I'm not going to get on the air and get myself an instant divorce. But I mean, I, I would say that 99% of our fights over the last 30 years have been because of our inability to properly communicate. And I think that's something that even as we are older, um, we are working hard at to try to make sure that we do better. And it, it's kind of fun because I've, we've watched both of our older sons do a really good job with the people that they date to make sure that they are, have open communications and so forth. And I think that, that that is just such an important part of any relationship is being able to have a good, open ability to feel like that you can be honest in a safe place to get your point across. Right, right. 
Um, effective communication is going to be key. Um, the first thing that you need to do is make sure that you're in a space that you can practice those I statements and not feel bad about them. I need, I want, I would like to have, um, making sure that you are taking ownership of what you need and what you want. And knowing that that's not selfish, it has to be discussed. Because if you want something and the other person wants something and it's not being discussed and you can't, you know, you're just saying, oh, okay, well, that's what you want to do. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. Because you don't want to, to harbor resentment moving forward. So that key communication is going to help you not harbor any type of resentment from the person. You know, they have to be willing to listen, though, and they have to be open to feedback so that communication is not a one-way street. And so we know that that's essential for building, you know, healthy and fulfilling relationships. If you don't have that, that's going to be tough because you have to be clear and direct about what you want. You always have to be clear and direct because I can't read your mind. <laughs> you know, I cannot read your mind. And so I need to know exactly what you want. And then I can say, yes, I can give that to you. I'm able to give that to you. No, I'm not able to give that to you or I'm able to give it to you in this way. And so it opens up the um, the door for, for more dialogue. Because even if you've been with somebody for, you know, 10, 12 years, you may not know exactly how they feel about cookies and cream, ice cream, because you haven't had dialogue. So you have to open yourself up for some of that dialogue and practice those I statements. And, um, you know, just remembering that communication takes practice as well. Um, it's not going to be that you get into this relationship and you are able to communicate top tier every time. See, that's, that's um, a hard thing because, like you said, if somebody's coming in with self-esteem issues or if they they you know, the power balance is out of that relationship, it takes a lot of courage to be able to open up and say, you know, I need this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it that's does. that's tough. And so, and then when you have someone that is not used to communication, or you have someone who is manipulative in their communication yeah. or, um, you know, things like that. You have to be able to communicate as well so that you can say, hey, that's not what I said or that's not what I mean. I need you to hear me. Uh, I need you to listen. So you have to be open to that because you don't want a different type of communication to come and then you guys are, you know, it turns into a huge ball of miscommunication. And I mean, that's a skill, like you said, and, and we're as we wrap up toward the end of the book, like I said, I'm not trying to give away the whole book. There's a lot more that we haven't even touched on this on, on, in the book. But these are just some things that jumped out at me. But, you know, chapter nine and 10, you got creating a new chapter, moving on and then avoiding toxic connections, preventing future unhealthy relationships. It sounds like if you learn how to communicate, even if you don't do it successfully in the in the relationship goes kablooey. Uh, that's a cartoon term, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that happens, then guess what? Even if you're in your next one, you're not going to repeat the same mistakes because you're going to go into the relationship saying, okay, these are my boundaries. These are my – all the things that you've learned in this process, you're going to be a lot happier in the next relationship right. you have. And you'll be able to identify those, and then you won't even get involved in it. <laughs> you know, you can yeah. just <laughs> That's right. Uh, Red flag. It's not going to be for me, yeah. And so you're, you're it's, and it feels good to be able to say, this is not for me. Yeah. And not feel bad about it. So, you know, in doing that, you really have to um, acknowledge your own patterns and triggers because you have to see where you're speaking from. Are you speaking from a place of hurt or are you speaking from a place of heal? So you really have to look at your own patterns to see where you are. You know, what, what was my pattern that led to? Un to these unhealthy relationships because sometimes people will get in four, five, six back to back. You know, every relationship that I've had has been this way or I've, I always deal with this certain type of person. And so looking at your patterns, you know, identifying those, looking at those, doing some self-reflection. Hey, what do I need to change here? You know, to, to not have the same outcome. Um, that's really going to help you prevent, you know, going into another unhealthy relationship. And like you said, recognizing those red flags right off. Hey, no, no, that's not it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just cost you dinner, basically. That that would be about mm -hmm. it. And, and trusting yourself. I don't think we do that enough. We don't trust ourselves, our instincts, our gut. 
you know, a lot of times, see, you know, they always say, you know, go with your first mind. Your first mind will never lead you wrong. And a lot of times it's not the first thing that we think. We go back to the second or third thing that we think because we're trying to rationalize that first thought. Um, and so just recognizing that and learning to trust your instincts and trust who you are as a person um, because you're going to be coming from a place of being healed. So being able to trust yourself. You know, and surrounding yourself with a good support service. You know, I'm sorry, good support system. And and I always say, I always having a good therapist. <laughs> exactly. Well, I would hope you would say that. I mean, that's obviously a very important thing. But, Justin, this has been a, a really delightful conversation. Thank you so much for being on. And I learned a lot. And the book is fantastic. It's The Power of Love. How can people find out how to get the book and how can they find out more about you? They can uh, find out more about me and get in the book on my website. It's um, www.justjocelyn.live, and that's www.justjocelyn.live. And my book is on the website, and how to contact me is also on the website. I'm on all the social media platforms. I'm on Facebook as Just Jocelyn, your favorite therapist. I'm on Instagram at Just Jocelyn, your fave therapist. And I'm also on TikTok, this Jocelyn Therapy. I think you'll get a kick out of my TikTok videos, um, as well as uh, Twitter at the same handle. So they can, I'm on all the uh, social media platforms as well as the website. So I would be happy to hear from anyone who has questions about it. In the last 20 seconds, what little bit of wisdom would you give our audience? Um, no pressure. Some, some people think that holding on makes us strong, but sometimes letting go makes you stronger. Amen. Amen. That's that. Yes. That right there. You know, it's funny because I do a big thing when I go speak. I talk about grabbing the rope and, you know, water skiing and everything. But, yeah, sometimes you just got to let go. And that, that's great. <laughs> Justin, it's been great. It really has. I've really enjoyed it. The book is fantastic. Um, and you really gave us some great wisdom today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for listening today, and a special thanks to our guest, therapist Jocelyn Lane, for joining us today. And if you'd like to hear this or any past episodes, well, guess what? You can subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app or on our MPB public media app. And more and more of you are doing that, by the way. Uh, you're listening to podcasts. Now you're talking as production of MPB Think Radio with this episode and podcast produced by the one and only and incredible Jermaine Flood. And join us next week, Monday at 10 a.m., I'm Marshall Ramsey. I hope y'all have a great week. Really do. Thank you for listening. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.